Thomas Pynchon, continued from Part 1. Section 3, Media Scrutiny. Relatively little is known about Thomas Pynchon as a private person. He has carefully avoided contact with journalists for over 40 years. Only a few photos of him are known to exist, nearly all from his high school and college days, and his whereabouts have often remained undisclosed. A review of V in the New York Times Book Review described Pynchon as a recluse living in Mexico and introduced the media brand name which has pursued Pynchon throughout his career. Nonetheless, Pynchon's absence from the public spotlight is one of the notable features of his life, and it has generated many rumors and apocryphal anecdotes. 1970s and 1980s After the publication and success of Gravity's Rainbow, interest mounted in finding out more about the identity of the author. At the 1974 National Book Award ceremony, the president of Viking Press, Tom Ginsberg, arranged for double-talking comedian Professor Erwin Corey to accept the prize on Pynchon's behalf. Many of the assembled guests had no idea who Corey was, and, having never seen the author, they assumed that it was Pynchon himself on the stage delivering Corey's trademark torrent of rambling pseudo-scholarly verbiage. Towards the end of Corey's address, a streaker ran through the hall, adding further to the confusion. An article published in the Soho Weekly News claimed that Pynchon was, in fact, J.D. Salinger. Pynchon's written response to this theory was simple. Not bad. Keep trying. One of the first pieces to cash in on Pynchon's burgeoning repute and notoriety after Gravity's Rainbow was a biographical account written by a former Cornell University friend, Jules Siegel, and printed in Playboy magazine. In the article, Siegel reveals that Pynchon had a complex about his teeth, so far as to have undergone oral surgery, was nicknamed Tom at Cornell, and attended Mass diligently, acted as best man at Siegel's wedding, and that he later also had an affair with Siegel's wife. Siegel recalls Pynchon saying he did attend some of Vladimir Nabokov's lectures at Cornell, but that he could hardly make out what Nabokov was saying because of his thick Russian accent. Siegel also records Pynchon's comment that, quote, every weirdo in the world is on my wavelength, end quote, an observation borne out by the crankiness and zealotry which has attached itself to his name and work in subsequent years, particularly across the Internet. 1990s and 2000s Pynchon's avoidance of publicity and public appearances caused journalists to continue to speculate about his identity and activities, and reinforced his reputation within the media as reclusive. More astute readers and critics recognized that there were and are, perhaps, aesthetic and ideological motivations behind his choice to remain aloof from public life. For example, the protagonist in Jeanette Turner Hospital's short story for Mr. Voss or Occupant, published in 1991, explains to her daughter that she is writing, quote, a study of authors who become reclusive, Patrick White, Emily Dickinson, J.D. Salinger, Thomas Pynchon, the way they create solitary characters and personae and then disappear into their fictions, end quote. More recently, book critic Arthur Salm has written that, quote, The man simply chooses not to be a public figure, an attitude that resonates on a frequency so out of phase with that of the prevailing culture, that if Pynchon and Paris Hilton were ever to meet, the circumstances, I admit, are beyond imagining, the resulting matter-antimatter explosion would vaporize everything from here to Tau Cedi 4. Belying this reputation somewhat, Pynchon has published a number of articles and reviews in the mainstream American media, including words of support for Salman Rushdie and his then-wife, Marianne Wiggins, after the fatwa was pronounced against Rushdie by the Iranian Ayatollah. In the following year, Rushdie's enthusiastic review of Pynchon's Vineland prompted Pynchon to send him another message, hinting that if Rushdie were ever in New York, the two should arrange a meeting. Eventually, the two did meet, and Rushdie found himself surprised by how much Pynchon resembled the mental image Rushdie had formed beforehand. In the early 1990s, Pynchon married his literary agent, Melanie Jackson, and fathered a son, Jackson, in 1991. The disclosure of Pynchon's location in New York, after many years in which he was believed to be dividing his time between Mexico and Northern California, led some journalists and photographers to try to track him down. Shortly before the publication of Mason and Dixon in 1997, a CNN camera crew filmed him in Manhattan. Angered by this invasion of his privacy, he rang CNN asking that he not be identified in the footage of the street scenes near his home. When asked about his reclusive nature, he remarked, quote, My belief is that recluse is a code word generated by journalists, meaning doesn't like to talk to reporters, end quote. CNN also quoted him as saying, quote, Let me be unambiguous. 
I prefer not to be photographed. End quote. The next year, a reporter for the Times managed to snap a photo of him as he was walking with his son. Pitchin's attempt to maintain his personal privacy and have his work speak for itself has resulted in a number of outlandish rumors and hoaxes over the years. Indeed, claims that Pynchon was the Unabomber, or a sympathizer with the Waco Branch Davidians after the 1993 siege, were upstaged in the mid-1990s by the invention of an elaborate rumor insinuating that Pynchon and one Wanda Tenaski were the same person. A spate of letters authored under that name had appeared in the late 1980s in the Anderson Valley Advertiser in Anderson Valley, California. The style and content of those letters were said to resemble Pynchon's, and Pynchon's Vineland, published in 1990, also takes place in Northern California, so it was suggested that Pynchon may have been in the area at that time, conducting research. A collection of the Tenaski letters was eventually published as a paperback book in 1996. However, Pynchon himself denied having written the letters, and no direct attribution of the letters to Pynchon was ever made. Literary detective Donald Foster subsequently showed that the letters were in fact written by an obscure beat writer called Tom Hawkins, who had murdered his wife and then committed suicide in 1988. Foster's evidence was conclusive, including finding the typewriter on which the Tenaski letters had been written. An article purporting to be the transcript of an interview with Pynchon in the wake of the September 11th attacks on the U.S. appeared in the December 2001 issue of Playboy Japan. Melanie Jackson, the author's wife and literary agent, subsequently denied the authenticity of this interview. Responding ironically to the image which has been manufactured in the media over the years, during 2004, Pynchon made two cameo appearances on the animated television series The Simpsons. The first occurs in the episode Diatribe of a Mad Housewife, in which Marge Simpson becomes a novelist. He plays himself with a paper bag over his head and provides a blurb for the back cover of Marge's book, speaking in a broad Long Island accent. Here's your quote. Thomas Pynchon loved this book almost as much as he loves cameras. He then starts yelling at passing cars. Hey, over here, have your picture taken with a reclusive author. Today only, we'll throw in a free autograph. But wait, there's more. The second appearance occurs in All's Fair in Oven War, which was the 16th season premiere. In this appearance, Pynchon's dialogue consists entirely of puns on his novel titles. For example, The Frying of Latka 49. Section 4. Works. V. 1963. Winner of William Faulkner Foundation Award. The Crying of Lot 49. 1966. Winner of Richard and Hilda Rosenthal Foundation Award. Gravity's Rainbow. 1973. 1974 National Book Award for Fiction. Judges' unanimous selection for Pulitzer Prize overruled by advisory board. Awarded William Dean Howells Medal of the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1975. Award declined. Slow Learner, 1984, collection of early short stories. Vineland, 1990. Mason and Dixon, 1997. As well as fictional works, Pynchon has written essays, introductions, and reviews addressing subjects as diverse as missile security, the Watts riots, Luddism, and the work of Donald Bartlemy. Some of his nonfiction pieces have appeared in the New York Times Book Review and the New York Review of Books and he has contributed blurbs for books and records. His 1984 introduction to the Slow Learner collection of early stories is significant for its autobiographical candor. More recently, he wrote the introduction to the Penguin Centenary edition of George Orwell's novel 1984, which was published in 2003. References used in the writing of this article include J.C. Batchelor, Thomas Pynchon is not Thomas Pynchon, or This is the End of the Plot Which Has No Name. Soho Weekly News, April 22, 1976. James Bone. Who the hell is he? Sunday Times, South Africa, June 7, 1998. CNN. Where's Thomas Pynchon? June 5, 1997. CNN Book News. Early Nobel announcement prompts speculation. September 29, 1999. Erwin Corey. Transcript of National Book Award acceptance speech delivered April 18, 1974. Andrew Irvin, Nobel Oblige, Philadelphia City Paper, 14th through 21st of September 2000. Don Foster, Author Unknown on the Trail of Anonymous, Henry Holt, New York, 2000. 
Douglas Fowler, A Reader's Guide to Gravity's Rainbow, Artist Press, 1980. Garrison Frost, Thomas Pynchon and the South Bay, The Aesthetic, 2003. William Grimes, Toni Morrison is 93 winner of Nobel Prize in Literature, New York Times Book Review, October 8, 1993. Christopher Hitchens, Salman Rushdie, even this colossal threat did not work, life goes on. The Progressive, October 1997. Jeanette Turner Hospital, Collected Stories, 1970 to 1995, University of Queensland Press, 1995. Peter Kiss, Pulitzer Jurors, his third novel, New York Times, May 8, 1974, page 38. Oliver Kramer, Interview mit John M. Kraft, Herausgeber der Pinchin Notes, Sick Eno. Adrian Page, Towards a Poetics of Hypertext Fiction, in The Question of Literature, The Place on the Literary in Contemporary Theory, edited by Elizabeth B. Bissell, Manchester University Press, 2002, ISBN 0719057442. George Plimpton, Mata Hari with a Clockwork Eye, Alligators in the Sewer, Review of V, New York Times Book Review, April 21st, 1963, page 5. Thomas Pynchon, A Journey into the Mind of Watts, New York Times Magazine, June 12, 1966, pages 34, 35, 78, 80 through 82, and 84. Thomas Pynchon, Words for Salman Rushdie, New York Times Book Review, March 12, 1989. Bill Roeder, After the Rainbow, Newsweek, edition 9... 3, 2... One. Bill Roeder, After the Rainbow, Newsweek 92, August 7, 1978. Paul Royster, Thomas Pynchon, A Brief Chronology, Faculty Publications, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, 2005. Arthur Salm, A Screaming Comes Across the Sky, But Not a Photo, San Diego Union-Tribune, February 8, 2004. Jules Siegel, who is Thomas Pynchon, and why did he take off with my wife? Playboy, March 1977. Tony Tanner, Thomas Pynchon, Methuen and Company, 1982. David Eulen, Gravity's End, Salon, April 25, 1997. Stephen C. Weisenberger, A Gravity's Rainbow Companion, Sources and Contexts for Pynchon's Novel, University of Georgia Press, 1988. Adrian Wisnicki, a Trove of New Works by Thomas Pynchon, Beaumark Service News Rediscovered. Pynchon Notes, 46 through 49, 2000 and 2001, pages 9 through 34. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copy left slash fdl HTML, except for the material originally featured on The Simpsons, which is under copyright. Excerpt taken from episode of The Simpsons, entitled Diatribe of a Mad Housewife. Original air date, January 25, 2004. Writer Robin J. Stein, director Mark Kirkland. Excerpt spoken by Thomas Pynchon. <laughs> 